this was birthed out of complete happenstance. I, like, I, I literally just happened to have met Neil deGrasse Tyson and happened to have been invited to his office. And the iconic Jizza just happened to be going there giving a visit. And I, we just happened to run into Helen Matzos, who was talking about, you should do something innovative with science. And that, like everything happened by accident. And, 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 and it was all serendipitous. It just all came together so beautifully. So I, 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 I don't have the words to contain how powerful this is. But, but with that being said, now we have to get a little bit into the nitty gritty and, and why we're here and why this is important. I don't need to describe to anyone here about the achievement gaps in education. I, I, I don't have to describe in much detail the fact that in the STEM disciplines, those achievement gaps almost double or triple. Um, I don't have to describe in much detail the fact that socioeconomically disadvantaged youth of color are dropping out of school, or rather getting pushed out of school at higher rates than their counterparts. And I don't have to describe the fact that everything in the world of education up until this point has told us that we need to focus on everything but youth culture. We've changed curriculum. We've changed administrators. We've had no child left behind. We've had all children left behind. We'd have race to the top. We've had race around the block, race to the corner. We've had every single possible approach to changing the field of education except for focusing on the culture of young people. And that's a travesty. And the reality is that this idea of focusing on the culture of young people is not stuff that I'm coming up with. Every educational theorist since the beginning of time has focused on the culture of the learner. And the culture of everybody but our young people is focused on in the classroom. And then they're told that they're not brilliant, that they can't be scientists. And our work here is to show that they are scientists, they are brilliant, and by focusing on the culture, we could change the game of education. Right. I won't talk for much further, but just to give just sincere thanks to everybody who's a part of this work and this initiative. This is not Chris Emden's idea by any stretch of the imagination. This is not Jizz's idea, although he's integral in it by any stretch of the imagination. This work is a response to the needs of our young people. The ones that tell us every day just by their actions, when they're in there rhyming and crafting rhymes or they're ciphering or they're battling, how brilliant they are. When they're crafting these rhymes and describing their environment in detail, using keen observation, describing phenomena, looking at the environment, using metaphor and analogy in brilliant ways, and then you go to see those same young people in the classroom and they're asleep. And then the school says, that they're not intelligent and that they're failing. And the minute we get them in the hip hop space, they exhibit set in intelligence. So all we're doing now is just showing what we know already exists. Bringing hip hop culture into the classroom and changing the game of education. Right now, I'd like to introduce one of our, not even one of our, like an iconic person because of their organization, rapgenius.com. I'm introducing Nicole Otero, who's, who's my, my home girl but someone who's also passionate about education just to talk for a few minutes. Nicole. For those of you who don't know what Rap Genius is, it's, uh, it's basically a Wikipedia for rap lyrics. So hip hop fans come on the site to read their favorite rapper's lyrics and if they're interested, they'll, they'll click on a line and, and a little box will pop up with this community explanation that's exploring the meaning behind those lyrics. And, uh, uh, but, it, but really it's become much bigger than that because now in addition to finding Jizz's lyrics or 50 Cent's lyrics, you, are, you can read Shakespeare and you can read The Great Gatsby which has been annotated by an AP literature class in Texas. You can read Bible verses, you can read Obama's speeches, uh, really anything you can think of and anything anyone is willing to upload to the site, you can read and explore the deeper meaning behind the text on Rap Genius. Um, so, you know, Chris was talking about how serendipitous this is, and there's no, it's, it's, it's pretty funny that we're called Rap Genius, and we've now partnered with the original genius, uh, who's also a Rap Genius, uh, for this project, Science Genius. So, um, you know, Jizza's perfect for the site because in his lyrics, in every single lyric, he's saying so much. And even the biggest hip hop head is never going to catch every reference, every subtle metaphor, every nuanced idea. So Rap Genius becomes a way in which everyone can come together and, and explore all of that meaning. Uh, and, and for his upcoming album, Dark Matter, which is going to basically be a science textbook, Rap Genius is going to make this album more widely understood by, by anyone who's willing to look into it. 
So uh, um, as you can imagine, Science Genius was a pretty natural collaboration for us. Uh, we're already interested in, 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 you know, we're hip hop nerds pretty much, and we're already interested in looking into this, the deeper meaning behind text. And we're just so happy, you know, because like Chris was saying, this idea that kids are so impassioned and influenced by music, and, and we know that firsthand coming from Rap Genius. We're just so happy to be able to bring that influence into the classroom in a way that will hopefully reach those students through science and music. Uh, you know, we're, we're just happy that Rap Genius can be the platform for them to upload scientific raps and then alongside their classmates and teachers and Jizza and scientists and anybody who cares to annotate the, the, the lyrics of their raps and, and the science concepts that they use to make those raps. So, you know, we're, like I said, we're so excited to be a part of this. Uh, we think that it has so much potential to reach students and, and to help them have a more acute understanding of uh, of science. Um. Not only is Rap Genius allowing the students to have their raps featured, but they are actually going to be profiling the work of these science MCs on their website. And you might not understand the power of that, except all the rappers that the students are listening to and enjoying on a regular basis are already featured on Rap Genius. So what we're doing now is we are positioning these young people who are creating these science raps on the same platform as the MCs that are being annotated. So People are being valued for whatever skills they may have, whatever nonsense they're spitting or rapping about. In this instance, they're going to be valued for their, scientifically, their scientific intellect and as valuable as any other MC. So that's what Rap Genius is doing. Um, right now, um, I, I have the honor to introduce um, Jizz's homie. So everybody talks about, you know, when you hear Jizz's people, you think like Wu Tang's about to storm through, right? <laughs> You know, Wu Tang killer bees on the swarm, but we're gonna be Wu Tang scholars on the school on the swarm. Um, but but just his homies are actually uh, not MCs. His homies are all scientists, and we have these this these this amazing crop of scientists who have volunteered their time. Some coming from other states, just here just to show love, so just and show love to this initiative. And um, I will introduce them now as soon as I find my notes uh, for them. And the reason why I can't find my notes for them is because their bios are nuts, right? Like, so I'll give the short version. I, I first would like to introduce David Kaiser, who is a professor at MIT where he teaches physics and the history of science. Um, he's here, like any other panelist, not representing the institution per se, just here as a person that shows love and who believes in this initiative. So please, David Kaiser, could you uh, come to the stage? Next, I'm introducing Radhi Tarial, who is MBA project manager from the Broad Institute of Global Health and Genomics, uh, bachelor's degrees more than, and master's degrees in the works. Um, and uh, she's an MBA grad from Harvard Business School, and she's going to talk about her work in science as well. So Radhi Tarial, please come to the stage. <laughs> Next, we have Daniel Goods, who is well, we just know where he works, and then you could tell his, you know, his nerd status. By the way, you know, nerd status is a good thing, right? <laughs> but um, Daniel Goods is a full-time artist at NASA's Jet Propulsion Lab, right? So we talk about this idea of going from STEM to STEAM, science, technology, engineering, mathematics, to science, technology, engineering, the arts and mathematics. So this is a person who lives that and embodies that just by his presence. So um, Daniel, please, up to the stage. <laughs> And um, uh, finally, my homie, Helen. Yes, my homie, Helen. Helen, this whole partnership would not have worked without Helen just planting the seeds to sort of spark the ideas of taking this further. And I, I'm so deeply appreciative to her just for her mind and her brain, but also her support to this work. She is uh, editor-in-chief of the popular online science publication, Astrobiology Magazine. You know, cop that. Um, she, she is also um, executive producer and director of the popular radio video show, Star Talk uh, with, with Neil deGrasse Tyson. And so, without further ado, Helen Matzos. Uh, and finally, John. And John is the curator in charge and professor uh, in the department of, wow, even the scientist is stumbling over this one. 
is theology at the American Museum of Natural History. Um, he's actually volunteered to have the winner of Rap Genius possibly come visit uh, with him and sort of hang out with him and find out all the cool nerd stuff that he does. Um, and so John, please come up. Panelists talk a bit about their work, but talk about the, you know their belief in this project, their partnerships with Jizza, and even partly some of their high school experiences. So I'm coming to you from MIT, uh, not all that far away, and I want to talk with you a little bit about uh, the research I do in physics. There's a, there's a real flaw in this program, by the way. So the idea is to get five scientists up here to talk about our work and keep us to five minutes each. That's like impossible. <laughs> like, scientifically, it's not going to happen. So I'll do my best. Anyway, so I'm going to talk about uh, why I spend my time. Wondering why the universe is lumpy. It's actually, I think, a really, really cool and very important question. So if we look around out in space, uh, we can look at it in all kinds of um, uh, lengths. We can look at it in a humongous, humongous grasp of clusters of galaxies, super clusters of galaxies, humongous, humongous scale. Things like the Hubble Space Telescope will capture with these amazing and very beautiful photographs. We can zoom in and look at a single galaxy. Like the one we live in, this is a picture of the second one down, is the Andromeda Galaxy, a lot like the one we live in in the Milky Way. And that's already, you know, 100 billion stars. It's, it's mind-boggling, right? And that's just one galaxy. We can zoom in, look at the environment around a given star, one star of those, and like our solar system here in a schematic picture. Uh, or indeed only come down closer to home, like the Empire State Building, right? What, what do we see across all of these different ways of grasping the universe? We see structure. We see non-randomness. We see places where there's lots and lots of stuff separated by lots and lots of empty places. We call those New Jersey, locally. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, from New Jersey. Um, so we, we see areas where there's huge, huge amounts of stuff packed very closely together, whether we're talking about clusters of galaxies and huge voids, all the way down to Manhattan itself. There's an amazing bundle of energy and matter. Uh, and then separated by spots where there's not that much stuff going on. Uh, and so how does that happen? So we can account for this clumpiness, the lumpiness of the universe, if we assume that to start with, there's already some lumps. So to get lumps, you have to assume there's lumps, and that's kind of circular, right? So if you give me some lumps, I can show why they're going to grow and get bigger and make things, everything from clusters of galaxies down to the Empire State Building, or that kind of scale of where we live. But where do the initial clumps come from? We, we need those first lumps. So I spend a lot of my time, most of my working life, I've now boiled down to one slide, so we'll see how this goes. <laughs> and it comes from combining two incredibly beautiful sets of ideas. These are just, they're amazing. At least I think they're amazing. So we start on the one hand with Einstein's relativity, general relativity. And the upshot, captured in this beautiful cartoon, uh, is that space and time are wiggly. Space and time are not the same everywhere in all, in all times and places. They can be warped. They can bend like a trampoline. So lesson number one is space is wiggly. And that's boiling down a few <laughs> textbooks. And then we combine with that other thing up top, which is meant to capture some of the weirdnesses of quantum theory, how we describe matter on the smaller scales, on the scales of atoms, of little parts of atoms, of little particles. And there, the real lesson is that matter is jiggly. I'm trying to throw Jizzy here a bone. I got space time is wiggly, <laughs> matter is, I can't, I'm not gonna be able to work with this. Right? The in the room, a lot of people in the room can't. So the, one of the main lessons, many lessons, one of the main lessons from quantum theory is that we can't stop matter from just doing this sort of quantum dance, the uncertainty principle. It won't sit still no matter how hard we try to make it. And so we combine those ideas with a lot of hard calculations, but we now think we know how to do those. The space itself can warp, space-time can warp, and the matter within that space-time can't help dancing around. That's the, that's the sort of heart of quantum theory. And then we start having a pretty good idea where those initial lumps came from. So we go back to this image of the entire universe seen uh, in the sort of earliest moment when light was even available to take a picture of it. Going back about more than 13 billion years ago, the universe looked sort of like that if we use false color imaging and do some processing. But it looks sort of like that if you squint. It's, it's not all one smoothness. There are lumps in it. Some areas show up in sort of yellowish. Some areas show up more like reddish, uh, blue and green. There's already a pattern of bumps and lumps, right? And now we think we know where those first lumps came from. We have a pretty good account for them. S uh, space and time could be jiggled around, uh, wits are wiggled around, and, and the matter inside that, even the parts inside atoms, uh, can't sit still. They have this quantum dance. So we put this together and we say, well, that's probably, that's a pretty good accounting for where these initial lumps might have come from. And then over time, will grow and grow and accumulate into things like these beautiful galaxies or all the way down to, say, Manhattan. We can have regions where there's lots of stuff compared to neighborhoods where there's not much going on. And we, we get that because at the earliest moments after the Big Bang, and it's according to this set of ideas, 
uh, this sort of quantum dance played out on this wobbly trampoline of space time. It set that initial, that initial lumpiness, and then over 13 billion years, those lumps would evolve to become the universe that we know. So not only can we say, well, here's a good story for why there should be lumps. You might have a, a better story, a different story. But we can, we can, we can push further with our, with our um, calculations. We can say, well, what patterns should there be in those lumps? Not just this random splay of colors, reds and yellows and greens and blues, but there should be patterns. If you compare the lumpiness in one part of space to the lumpiness in another part of space, it shouldn't, there should be a, a kind of underlying pattern. And this red curve, you can see that red, viewed, I think very beautiful, swooping curve, and it kind of rings like a bell and dies out. So that's our theoretical prediction. We put these ideas together from general relativity and quantum theory. We say this is, there should be patterns of the lumps that we could characterize in this very specific way with lots of numbers, with math. And then these amazing magicians uh, go out and try to measure the patterns in those lumps. And we have teams now all over the world. They use several different satellites that are up in space. They use telescopes uh, in South America, North America, and Europe. They use balloons launched from Antarctica. I mean, it's an amazing worldwide effort now. Uh, it's been going on in, uh, for, for, for decades. Uh, and we can combine all that information, and the measurements look breathtaking, right? They fall right on that red line, at least most of them do. So we had, an, we had an accounting from our, just using our imaginations from our minds, from combining Einstein's legacy with relativity and the legacy of quantum theory about this quantum dance. We said there should be lumps there. They should have a certain pattern to them, and they can actually be measured, and they're, and they're basically spot on. It's, I consider that breathtaking, and that's why I spent a lot of time thinking about it. Um, I gotta say, I'm excited for Jizz's new album. I'm, I'm looking forward to that. I'm at least as excited, maybe more excited, for the next set of data from an even cooler satellite up in, up in space right now. Because maybe it'll come out, maybe that data will come out the same time as Dark Matters. They actually both set for about the same release. So, uh, so this is ongoing stuff that is you know, tremendously exciting and well worth rapping about. We have, we've now accounted for the lumpiness of the universe and in some sense why we're here. So I was asked to say something about high school, not always, <laughs> well, I'll say something about high school. So I grew up not so far from here, West Orange, New Jersey, a suburb of uh, the great city of New York, uh, public high school. I had some just astonishingly inspiring teachers. And I look back and I appreciate them, of course, more now than when I was there. I didn't know right, how good it was. Uh, and I had a lot, including some amazing science teachers. And so uh, they were there with me after school with a bunch of the kids. After school, they'd nurse our interest. They'd tell us that we could do it. They made us feel like our ideas were worth listening to. Most of them probably weren't at the time, but the teachers didn't tell us that. So I had this really actually very inspiring set of teachers and nurturing you know, me and a bunch of my friends. And also, I had all these books. I had a legacy that we all have. These sometimes very exciting books. These are some of the ones that I was reading as a kid. There are lots and lots of them out now. Uh, many of them written with, written with great passion and really very lovely, sort of boiling down the kinds of cartoons and pictures I just waved in front of you for a moment to say, here are some amazing and I think very beautiful ideas about the cosmos, about relativity, uh, about the structure of matter. Uh, and these are available to all of us. These are in you know, any library we can, we can, we can look to. So in high school, I was being um, sort of built up by some really uh, tremendously talented and, and very giving teachers. And I could kind of explore, as we all can, uh, some, some pretty inspiring books as well. And that really, I got hooked pretty early on. So here's my last slide. You know, uh, when I met with Jason the first time of a year ago, uh, he very patiently sat through my lecture longer than this one on lumpiness and quantum theory and why the universe, he, was, he seemed to, uh, he, he was very polite. So we talked a lot about that. Um, he actually asked a lot of good questions. We met a second time last spring with a couple more of my friends, uh, other physicists at MIT. We talked more about the universe. Is there more than one universe? Could it be a multiverse? These, right, these cool and crazy ideas. We also talked about what it's like to grow up in our fields. And here it was kind of fun to compare notes, right? So what does it take to work in cosmology today, right? I think it comes down to imagination and discipline, if I had to boil it down. We have to imagine space and time wobbly like a trampoline and this quantum jitter. And, we, and everyone has that. We, everyone can do that. That's imagination. But it takes the discipline to grind through the homework, sometimes not always so much fun, to work through getting to that red curve and those, and those black dots that measure. That's a discipline to it, too. And, and there's a way in which you grow up in the field. Here's a picture of uh, my, my extended family. There's a bunch of my students and a colleague. These are students from very early undergraduate through people working on their PhDs, people finish their PhDs doing postdocs. We get together, we work together, and they roll up their sleeves together. And we learn from each other. I learn a lot from my undergraduates, uh, maybe more than the inverse sometimes. 
Uh, and there's a way in which you grow up in the field. And we talk with Jizz about, you know, you don't just become this amazing musician, this amazing rap artist. It takes a lot of imagination and a lot of discipline. And you grow up and you get taught by, you know, apprentices. So it was actually really fun comparing notes with Jizz about the process of getting into, into our worlds. And I'm so glad our worlds have collided. So I'll stop there. Thanks so much. Do, do you hear what he's describing in this, this cutting edge research, though? Beautiful swoops, lumpiness, engaging, love, beautiful. Like, all these things that, when you think about the traditional science classroom, are not at all part of the discussion. But the folks who are actually doing the science are so deeply immersed in this aesthetic piece of it. There's a big separation between school science and real science. And we are working to make sure that we bridge that gap to make school science more like real science. I'm here today to uh, talk to you a little bit about my uh, experience in the world of science. Um, and rather than give you explicit details about high school uh, or exact details of my work, I, I thought I might give you a sort of flavor of the uh, cultural mashup that was uh, my early life uh, and how this led eventually to my journey into science and into science communication, uh, where I have eventually landed as uh, executive producer of Star Talk Radio with Neil deGrasse Tyson uh, and had the opportunity to meet Jizza uh, and uh, Chris Emden. So um, I'm going to tell you a story. Uh, and it, it starts uh, with the fact that my family, I come from a uh, Greek, uh, Greek American, Greek immigrant family. Um, I grew up in the deep south uh, in a, a suburban neighborhood in a place called Huntsville, Alabama. Uh, uh, you may have heard of this. It is uh, the home of the Marshall Space Flight Center uh, at NASA, um, where the Apollo program was uh, built and designed. Uh, so anyway, I, I grew up in Huntsville in this suburban neighborhood that had been built uh, literally in a, in a field, uh, a cotton field. And since we lived on the uh, edge of this uh, suburb, I, we were literally surrounded by cotton on three sides. So uh, it's not everybody who can say they, they grew up in a cotton patch, but, but I did. <laughs> Uh, and, and so uh, we grew up with, uh, if anybody seen uh, my big fat Greek wedding, you've seen their, their outside dancing Greek in their neighborhood and, and roasting lambs and everybody is named Nick uh, or, you know, or Tony or somebody like that. Uh, and so anyway, that, that was a, a very interesting experience to, to say the least. So, but the good thing about growing up there was I, I had a, this deep proximity to, to nature. Um, and so uh, this led to my early days uh, in my childhood, basically as a naturalist, where I would ride out into, to the farm, uh, drag back plants, uh, bugs, and bones from dead animals, and drag them home, and much to my mother's horror, mm -hmm. as, as you can imagine. Um, and, but, but more than this, our, our house uh, lied on the edge of this uh, farm, which had budded the Redstone uh, Arsenal, which is the arsenal um, on which uh, Werner von Braun and his rocket science team came and tested and developed, as I said, the Apollo uh, rockets uh, that eventually took men to the moon. Uh, so, so there we were uh, in this suburb in a cotton field in Alabama on the edge of a uh, <laughs> of the arsenal, and our house would literally shake like an earthquake twice a week, and things would jump off of, the, off of our walls, and, and uh, things would break, and the dog would howl, and you know. And my, my mother was not amused by this at all. So fast forward to high school and uh, to college, and uh, as a, uh, I like to refer to myself as an accidental biologist, in a sense, uh, with a, I had, as I say, I had a predilection for collecting bugs and bones. So I, I did, you know, naturally find my way into to studying science. And of course, what with the house shaking and living in this environment of, of uh, the Apollo program and German scientists marching around our city, it's really no wonder uh, that I, I grew up to work for NASA, um, which, by the way, was basically our, our local industry. 
So in my first years at the Marshall Space Flight Center, um, I discovered that not only did I have the great privilege to work with extremely brilliant and creative minds, um, but that I could also participate and contribute in a way that uh, I, I had never dreamed possible. And particularly, though, it was, it was very, very fun to go home and to try to explain to my friends and family uh, what it was that I, I did there. Um, but, but believe me, it was not very easy uh, explaining to my, my Greek family, you know, what we did at NASA because they were in the restaurant business, so it really didn't make any sense to them at all. <laughs> so when I would start talking to them about bioconvective forces or electrophoretic phase separation, their eyes would glaze over, like, like many people's naturally would. And, and my mother would say, but what does that have to do with, with your Greek heritage and, 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 you know, where we come from? And I said, well, mother, you know, the Greeks, they had Pythagoras and... Uh, <laughs> Euclid, and, and, and we're just, I'm just following along in the, that, that uh, you know, lineage. And so that got her attention, it hooked her, because she, she got a cultural hook. All of a sudden, it, it made some meaning and importance to her. And, and I, I sort of got the idea, and I, I understood uh, that in order to be able to explain anything uh, to a non-science audience, uh, that you had to be able to infuse your information with cultural and emotional uh, hooks, uh, enough so that they felt comfortable in even broaching or hearing about so-called you know, science uh, and things that they may be scared or intimidated of. So uh, my work throughout the rest of my career has basically just been focused on that, which is trying to communicate science uh, to a public uh, which would normally not really want to, to hear about it or and, and, and I've, I've had a deep desire to, to reach ever deeper um, into making science culturally relevant and engaging to those who may feel disenfranchised or who uh, can't or don't uh, feel like they, they want to understand. So was this in, with this in mind, when I eventually came to commission a rap from a uh, British uh, rap artist who also happened to be uh, getting his master's degree in science communication in London. Um, and much to our surprise, this thing got, the, the rap went up on YouTube, got over a quarter of a million uh, hits. Uh, it was picked up and noted uh, in Nature Magazine, Nat Geo, Popular Science, I don't know, over, over 20 and beyond even science magazines. It got a lot of attention. And it uh, just underscored to me the fact that this could be an extremely important cultural, uh, culturally relevant way to engage um, our, our youth um, uh, through the use of rap and possibly setting up these rap battles so that uh, at the end of the day uh, they, they might be able to exhibit their expertise uh, along the lines of things that they, you know, would be good for them to know in science uh, as well. So uh, it was it was my great pleasure to, to finally have the opportunity to invite Jizza to be on Star Talk Radio with uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson, and uh, it was also very very fortuitous, uh, Christopher. Where where are you? Uh, uh, that that you could. Uh, that you happen to also be in Neil's office and that you agreed to come uh, into our studio to record the show um, which uh, will be airing in fact tomorrow at noon on the Nerdist channel. Uh, so you will all be able to tune in, uh, see the interview between Neil and Jizza and then hear uh, the, the very I think deep and revealing conversations that Neil had with Christopher Emden and our co-host uh, Chuck Nice. So I hope you'll all tune into that on the Nerds channel. And thank you for having me. Hi, I'm Dan Goods. Um, I'm not, uh, yeah, see, it comes up there. So I'm not representing NASA here, but uh, I'm going to tell you about where I get to work. So let's go to the next slide. 
I work at this place, there's 5,000 people. We live, uh, we're in Pasadena, this is at the foothills, uh, it's right next to the Rose Bowl, there's 5,000 people that are working on amazing things. And so we, we develop things that are from telescopes that look at galaxies far, far away, to uh, lots of satellites that go around the Earth that look at uh, the oceans and the atmosphere. And uh, we also make things, unfortunately this was supposed to be a movie of us landing on Mars. And some of you guys might have heard about that recently, that we landed this one ton robot on Mars. And so it's an amazing place. And there's, uh, you know, this is sort of the way that you think about getting to a place like this. You know, you, you gotta be really smart and go to all the right places, right? <laughs> I was not one of those people. So, uh, actually, moved through a couple of these things. So, so I had my own path. Um, <laughs> so I wasn't interested in high school. I, you know, I slept through my math class. It wasn't that I wasn't smart. It was that I wasn't passionate about anything. And so, uh, let me go to the next slide there. Uh, I, I found that I became passionate about creating experiences for people. And, uh, and doing it through the arts. And uh, these last two little things actually helped a lot. Uh, if you want to get a job sometimes, <laughs> send a giant envelope with your resume in it. Uh, and the next one there. Uh, this is a whole other topic, but I can tell you about this some other time. But uh, you go to the next one here. So, so eventually I got this chance to work at the Jet Propulsion Lab as an artist. And one of the first things I did was that they were working on these missions to find planets around other stars and that's so sci-fi right and um, and they give me all these numbers and if you recall from my GPA numbers aren't my strong suit right? <laughs> and so to me I have to create things and uh, to really understand it and so uh, what you see here is a grain of sand and there's a little tiny hole in it and that's what's cool about being at JPL is I can go somewhere and say, can you drill a hole into a grain of sand for me? And they're like, sure, sure. <laughs> so if this grain of sand were our galaxy, so we have billions of stars in our galaxy, that hole represents where we have found thousands of planets around other stars. And then if you want to see the rest of the known universe, uh, you have to have six rooms full of sand. And so I'll do these installations where you'll have lots of sand and then you'll look under this magnifying glass and, and either go, oh man, we're really small or you know, you'll, you'll see lots of different types of things. Um, yeah, so you go to the next slide. So this kind of gives you a sense of, of that. Unfortunately, I'm not able to show any movies, uh, but most of my uh, pieces really are, are experiences. So if you just Google Dan Goods, you can, you can find that type of stuff. But um, I, I like to call this sneaking up on learning. And so I like to create things that are mysterious, that are beautiful, that are you know unusual, and you kind of get drawn to it. And you don't know why, but you just want to know what, what is this thing all about. And then, uh, and then once you find it, you learn a little bit more, and you learn, and then you've actually learned something, and you've learned something about deep, uh, deep meanings about the universe, hopefully. And so uh, what I love about, let's see, make sure I'm on the right thing here. What I love about what's going on with, with this initiative is that it's dealing with lots of different ways of learning. And uh, my wife was really good at memorizing facts, and she did really well in, in high school and all that sort of thing. I'm not that kind of person. I have to, like I said, I have to create, create things for me to understand. Uh, tomorrow I'm actually going to talk to, some, uh, to a dance troupe about um, ways in which they can use their physical bodies and, and dance and movement in trying to understand the physics of the universe. So some people need to move around. And then other people, you know, they need to, they need to do poetry and they need to rap. And that's their way of learning. And so, you know, it's the 21st century. There's uh, a lot of things that are huge challenges for us. And we can't lose these people because we're not, these young people, because we're not being relevant relevant in their lives and, and trying to teach them in relevant ways. And so, if nothing else, I hope that, I, I personally think that every person needs a moment in their life where they get to experience the awe of the universe. And if they get to do it through rap and poetry, then I'm all for it. Thank you. My name is Reedy Terrell. Sophia's motion for me to go to this podium, but I feel like it actually hides people. So I'm going to stay here. Um, I'm here to, as Chris said, to show love to the initiative, to Jizza. I have a lot of love for hip-hop, um, but today I want to talk to you about my love for science. 
I um, don't have any slides, I have no videos, no pictures, so I'll, I'm sorry about that. I'm just going to talk to you and tell you a story. Um, Chris mentioned that I do work at the Broad Institute. It's, they do a lot of good work, everything from basic to translational research, and they're, they're under, trying to understand the genetic basis of disease, everything from cancer to diabetes and much, much more. But what I do more specifically, I manage a project that's exploring this interesting relationship that humans have with pathogens. So you guys know that there's bacteria, viruses, parasites that live with us, they live on our skin, they live in, in our intestines, sometimes they're in our blood, right? And what I want you to know is, is that these pathogens have the ability to influence the trajectory of our genetic future, and they can provide us insights into our genetic past. So I work with this lab at Harvard, which believes that one such pathogen called loss of virus, which causes loss of fever, um, has actually very much impacted the evolution of certain West African populations. And if you don't know loss of fever, you should go, go, go home and Google it tonight. Don't do it here. Um, it's, a, it's an acute viral hemorrhagic fever, and it can be fatal. It's very important to study. Um, so I'm going to tell you a little bit more about this and go in deeper, because it's fundamental to why science is so fascinating to me. Um, discoveries, you know, are, are the things that, things that drive science. And they're presumably answers to something, but inevitably they lead to more questions. And it can be daunting, but to me it's one of the loveliest aspects of the entire discipline. And here's a story of how one discovery inspired everything I do for my job on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, so Dr. Cardi Sabetti, who's also a scientist at Harvard um, and a friend of Jizz's, developed this statistical method which looks for signals of selection in humans. In other words, these are mutations in our DNA that allow us to adapt to environmental pressures such as deadly pathogens. So in essence, she used the beauty of math to identify a group of people in West Africa, the Yoruba in Nigeria, who have a common mutation in their DNA that not any other group in the world has. So why is that? Why is it that this group have this mutation in their DNA? What kind of pressure, selective pressure, would have caused such a noticeable uptick in a mutation in such a specific group? That's the question we wanted to answer. Now get this, working simultaneously across the country in a separate institution, there are other scientists that discover that the receptor, which is suspected to let loss of virus into your cells, may be controlled genetically by the same mutation that Dr. Sabetti found in this Yoruba tribe. That's fun fact number two. Now, we've known for a while that Lhasa is, is endemic in certain West African countries, including Nigeria. And as I've mentioned, the, that's exactly where the Yoruba are from. So with that, we had enough pieces of the puzzle to come up with a hypothesis. And the hypothesis is this, that people that live in West Africa who have this particular mutation are resistant to Lhasa fever. And if this is the case, individuals who carry the mutation were more likely to survive, pass the mutation on to their children. And if that's true, and we can identify the resistance-causing mutations, it could lead to further understanding therapies for this disease. Um, so that's just a hypothesis, right? Which is a little bit more comforting than just only having questions, because you have a guess as to what's going on. Um, but it's not as good as having an answer. And so right now, we're in the middle of trying to confirm the hypothesis or find the answer. And here's what we've done so far. We've launched a study in West Africa to take a mathematical abstraction, put it together with biological clues, arrive at a possible answer as to why one mutation would rise so quickly in a given population and test it by going to Africa and trying to confirm it. So that's what I do for my job, and I love it. And another nice aspect of the job is you get to meet interesting people all the time, and one of the most engaging people that I have met is Jizza. And um, he's just so enthused about science that it's contagious. Uh, we study a lot of viruses in our lab, and we jokingly say that we're all infected by science. Science can be as strong a vector for infection as anything out there. Um, and it's infected me, and I can see it's infected Jizza, and I hope that the fervor re reaches the students of New York. So hi, my name's John Sparks. I work at the Museum of Natural History just down the road here, and I, uh, we've heard a lot of really cool things about space, but I'd like to kind of bring it back to Earth and say they're really cool, just as cool things right off the shore of New York here. Really bizarre creatures that are just as alien as anything you'll find in outer space. 
Um, so I really, you know, I'm very excited to be here. I was you know, just ecstatic when I heard that Jizza wanted to meet me and talk about my science, because I, I love the Wu-Tang Clan for years. My friends were so jealous. Um, they all, <laughs> you know, all over the, you know, I emailed them right away, said, hey, Jizza's coming. They said, oh, you know, you're, you're so lucky. And I, got, you know, I was able to get a bunch of autographs for him, so Jizza was great and sent them around, so they were quite happy. But uh, it, it's great, and I think it's 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 this initiative is extremely important. Um, I got into science very very late because I grew up in an area of the Midwest where science was not thought of as being important at all. So it took me a long time to come around and realize I could I could make a living at science. I never thought I could. I got a degree in economics. You know, went out, got a job, was bored as hell. So I mean, I just I couldn't <laughs> take it. So. And then I you know went around and volunteered, or did a lot of jobs around the world volunteering in science. Loved it. Came back and, and was able to get into graduate school. But it was much later than uh, than most people do it. But I think the important thing is you have to kind of find um, your passion. And a lot of that is just simply exposure to things. If you don't have the exposure, you're never you know you're never going to have a chance. I didn't like I said I didn't have the teachers that did it. Later in life, I ran into some people who were great. And that's kind of all it took, just that initial kind of exposure to something. I was, I was hooked right away on fish, and I've never gone back. I love, I love what I do. So what I kind of work on, I work on bioluminescence, which is a chemical reaction that takes place in living organisms. Instead of producing heat, they give off light. And what's really cool about it, when people think about it, the ocean is a huge, huge space. It's almost 100%, uh, essentially 99.5% of the volume occupied by life is in the oceans. And over 90% of this is perpetually dark. So it's a huge, huge environment, and there's no ambient light. So all of these creatures down there, they live by producing their own light. And you know, people are familiar with fireflies, which they see in the summer, but there's also tons of marine creatures that do it. The group over on the right of that slide are called pony fishes. They're found in the Indo-Pacific. And the males have this unique light organ. They, they take in bacteria when they're really young, these bacteria that glow when they're in high concentrations. And they give off signals. Each one has a unique signal they give off that the females recognize. So these fish are really boring, silvery things. No one ever really looked at them. <coughs> You'd never give them a second look until you look at their, their light organ. And it's really amazing. So they've got this really, just as amazing as fireflies, this system where they signal each other. And just to show you some of the cool things we have, these are fish that you can find, very similar ones, right off the coast of New York here, right in the Hudson Trench. They're all out there. They're bizarre as anything. This one's an angler fish. It's a female. The male is actually, um, there's a small male to attach this one. You can barely see it. The males are actually really degenerative. All they do is swim around, look for a female to fuse to, and then they basically turn into an attached gonad. They degenerate. <laughs> and so, so. She's, got a, she's got a mate for life that, pro that provides sperm for her to reproduce and it just attaches. Sometimes these females have lots of males attached. So it's a really bizarre mating strategy. But what's really cool about them, this one actually has two systems of light. In that lure over its head, this, this, this is a fully grown female. They're about this big. You see these things on Nemo and they seem like these monstrous dagger, you know, fish with dagger-like teeth. They're actually adults are very, very tiny, most of these deep sea fish. There's just not much to eat down there. But it, it uses bacteria in the lure over its head. That big thing you see hanging off, it actually hangs off its chin. It makes the light itself in there. It's the only known organism that has two systems of bioluminescence. And that's, when you think about it, pretty darn cool. It's evolved in there. And we also kind of look at, this is a siphonophore that was just found in the Gulf of Mexico, deep sea siphonophore. This thing uses fluorescence tied to bioluminescence. So it, uses, it makes its own light, transfers it to a fluorescent protein, which then gives off red light. The red light attracts um, certain types of fish, which it feeds on in the deep sea. And the, this is the way the siphonophore can attract, you know, without, it doesn't really move around, it kind of flows through the currents and can attract its prey. So what we kind of do, I kind of got into this aspect of it accidentally too, this is biofluorescence now. This is when you shine a light at something, it gives off a wavelength that's of less energy than you put into it. So we take high energy light, blue, violet, shine it at things, and we're able to find out that lots of things in the ocean are fluorescent, give light back off. Corals, as you see down here in the corner, there's some... Uh, some worms that live in the ocean, but what was really interesting, this is an octopus in this picture, this big blue image up there. And we never even noticed this little fish. It was a little eel down in the corner, you can see in the bottom corner there that's lighting up green. The first time an eel was ever shown to be fluorescent, it was totally accidental. And this is just kind of what we found. So across, um, we started looking at fluorescence and almost, there's tons of fish that are fluorescent out there. So it's just a matter of looking. So these really cool phenomena um, occur in the ocean, and we'd never really known it before. It's just basically going out and looking. Um, so I think it's you know it's 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 extremely um, you can once you find something that hooks you, there's always little avenues you can take. It never gets boring. You know, you, I worked a lot in Madagascar, coming out. I did my PhD there, and then moved on to to 
the, the ocean, and I'm, I'm just hooked on the ocean. I get to go out scuba diving on trips, go submersibles, things like that. So it's a, it's a heck of a lot of fun. Um, so basically, uh, I want to finish up to just tell you a little bit about my research and also say that, um, as Chris mentioned, I'd be happy, you know, for the winners of this, this, uh, this battle, I would love to give, you know, put the prize of giving you a behind-the-scenes tour at the museum. Most people don't realize we have huge, huge collections at the museum behind the scenes. Lots of, lots of um, research going on there. People see the halls out front, but as curators, we really have very little to do with the halls, surprisingly. People ask me, oh, are you out doing the exhibits? Really very little. I just did one, the one that's there now on bioluminescence, creatures of light, if you've seen it. That was the first one I ever curated. So there's a lot of science behind the scenes. So I think it'd be great. We'll bring in the winners of, of this contest, show them behind the scenes, kind of what we do, take them through the collections, take them through a couple of the exhibits, and kind of show what we do on a, on a, on a daily basis. So um, like I said, I'm extremely excited about the initiative, and, and thank you so much for having me. So when you think about sciences, did you imagine it would be that engaging? <laughs> Not at all, right? It, it's purposeful. <laughs> Um, and I've, I've just sat on the sideline just soaking in, learning so much. Like, I know now about promiscuous fish, and, <laughs> you know, the fact that I have durable roots makes me, like, you know, feel really good right now. Um, so, thank you guys so much just for sharing your work and for being here and for introducing this audience to the beauty of science. Um, right now, I have the honor to finally introduce um, the 10 schools. <laughs> right? And um, once the word about this initiative got out, everyone was inundated with emails. I mean, like, it was crazy. And we selected 10 schools. Of those 10 schools, there's one person from each school, at the very least, who was here today. Um, and so I'm just going to name the schools. Please, you know, clap for them. They'll be like, nah, they're from Harlem. I'm not repping them. You know, <laughs> so everybody, so everybody love. And, um, and, and, um, you know, it was such a tough process to select the schools, but the criteria were, they weren't complex. It was schools that were populated by youth who traditionally don't do well in science, um, where the administrators or the young people really showed an interest and a passion for the arts, um, and that were willing to learn more about science, and that was pretty much it. So, here are the schools. Um, the first school that I'm announcing is Bronx Compass. Anybody from Bronx Compass in the building? Platform. This side. I see you. Um, next, um, Ellis Preparatory Academy. Congratulations to Ellis and their rapping chemistry teacher. Um, you guys need to hear his verse on. Uh, stand up with your call. Yeah, stand up with your call, please. But he has a verse to um, black and yellow. But instead of black and yellow, black and yellow, it's hydrocarbon, hydrocarbon. It's good. Next. My baby's Marie Curie High School. <laughs> Marie Curie in the building, right? Um, also, Park East High School. <laughs> Mr. Daniel, one of my favorite teachers ever. Hillside Arts High School. <laughs> Brooklyn Community Arts and Media High School. August Martin High School. I can't believe people are shy to stand up when called. It's fascinating. Um, you, how are you going to rap when you can't stand up when we call you? Right? Valdez Prep High School. Not to show much any bias, but Valdez has one of the most amazing science teachers of all time. I, she's amazing. Um, Urban Assembly School for the Performing Arts. And just really quickly about Ur Urban Assembly. Uh, yesterday, I was working with one of my grad students, Ian Levy, and um, just doing some final work about the project. And we said, you know, kids haven't written rhymes yet. And we had a young man who was there, and he was like, um, are you going to let me spit? And I was like, well, we didn't really have plan on it. So, you know, Kai is going to actually spit a verse at some point today. We'll, we'll throw in a liquid source instrumental. All right. <laughs> Certainly not least, Arts and Media Prep High School. <laughs> and so these schools, come January, they're going to be really getting into it. It's going to be amazing. But without any further ado, this is probably leading to my most exciting part because, oh, by the way, I was checking the tweets. You guys are tweeting heavy in the beginning. Then the science tweets, they were just a little bit more scant. 
you've got to step your science game up, people. <laughs> Seriously. Um, but, but, but here we finally introduce a, an amazing interview that was done by Nicola Terra from Rap Genius and, and Jizza, where he really starts delving into why this work and why science. And then after that, he will come and share some words. So, so he, here's this amazing interview with uh, Nicole and Jizza. I think this can work for any any type of subject. It can work for history. It can work for math, literature, all forms of learning. I mean, can be expressed and used to teach through music. I just choose science. You know? They say that you know, they just said that the first thing a newborn pays attention to when he's born or it's born, he or she is sound. Everything vibrates. And universe's music. I mean, if you think about our early days of growing up, we've learned our ABCs in the form of music where it had a rhythm to it. And it also rhymed. We would say A, B, C, D, E, F, G. Almost like a lullaby. H, I, J, K, L, M, N, O, P. I think, you know, I'm just a songwriter. I'm a songwriter. I'm a writer. I'm an MC. And I have a unique way of speaking about things, regardless of what it is. You know, the, the thing about being an MC and a good MC is to challenge yourself with different subjects and not just speak about the same thing all the time, to be able to incorporate several things. You know, nowadays, subject matter is the same. Either you're rhyming about the cars or the girls or the clubs. And I usually tell kids that's rapping or want to learn how to rap or just started to rap to challenge themselves and, and write a rhyme or a story and write it in the 1700s, write it in the 1600s. So and when, you, when you give them that challenge, they're like, whoa, I can't talk about cars. I can't talk about clubs. I can't speak about the chains we're wearing now, the, the Gucci, the Prada. So it challenges them to think and really work their brain really, really get to thought mode. Teachers, they just can't reach students how music will reach students. So they have, I think they need a different format or way of teaching and to incorporate music or rhyme for the reason, or well, rhyme should be the reason. But one is cool, it's hip. You know, some children don't think their parents are hip and cool. So they look at their teachers how they look at their parents. Unless they have a cool teacher that has a young vibe and he or she can relate to the children in a way the parents can't. But other than that, you're going to look at your teachers as, as your parents. And sometimes they just don't get it. It has to be hip and cool for a kid to be into it. 
it's not just about creating a scientific rhyme, but it's, a, it's more about the connection with yourself in the universe, the oneness. When the MCs came, tell them about the names, man. Iconic, um, amazing, brilliant, uh, gifted MC scientist, um, Jizza. Iconic. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for the introduction, Chris. Thank you, David, Helen, well, uh, Daniel, Reedy, and John coming down to support the effort. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Before space and time, there appeared a speck of light that was infinitely hot, so extremely bright. Within the center of this great shining, it was massive energy that was expanding in great timing. Within this fireball was all of space, a very special place with information and case. Literally, the beginning. This cosmic clock was ticking and allowed space to flow before spinning. Everything we see around us, the sun, the moon, the stars, and millions of worlds that astound us. The universe in size is hard to fathom. It was composed in a region small as a single atom, less than one trillionth the size, the point of a pen, microscopic, but on a macro level with then. <laughs> My name is Jizza from the Wu-Tang Clan. <laughs> Once again, it is an honor to be here at Teachers College to discuss science genius, in particular on 12-12-12. Since 2001, I've done something to commemorate the triple number day. But I can't think of a better way to culminate the, the tradition to be here with all of you to talk about this program. Most people associate Wu-Tang with Staten Island. But I was born in Brooklyn and lived in mostly all the boroughs by the time I was 10, native New Yorker. I left high school in the 10th grade and it was one of my greatest regrets in life. I am here not as a teacher, nor expert, nor genius. These, these guys are the experts. But I'm here as a science enthusiast who wants to inspire New York City public high school students to get excited about biology, chemistry, and physics. <laughs> I wish there had been a more compelling way to captivate my imagination about science when I was in school. The interaction between matter and energy has always aroused my interest and curiosity. When I was around six, about the age of six years old, I can remember playing with two pieces of steel or metal. One of them was magnetic and the other was not. And the piece with the magnetic attracted the piece with doubt. I flipped them in opposite directions and they repelled each other as if some force was pushing them apart. I found this fascinating, very fascinating. Years later, I would come to learn that every single atom in our body came from the cores of stars that was created billions of years ago. From the skin cells to the iron in our blood, the carbon in our genes to the gold on your finger all created over 13 billion years ago. Not only is that very inter interesting or interesting connection, it is also a great one. This is a very unique bond that makes you look at life in a whole different perspective and see the beauty in everything. In the last year, I was able to meet with some top scientists in the world, some of the top scientists in the world, including those whom you just heard from. At MIT, I met with biological oceanographer Penny Chisholm, geneticist Eric Lander, founding director of the Broad Institute at MIT. At Cornell University, I met Alexander Gaeta, and last but not least, Neil deGrasse Tyson. It was incredibly humbling and inspiring to meet with these people, but I do believe the future Pennies, Davis, Nils, are the young students that are in New York City public schools today.
Not only was it interesting to see how dedicated and committed they were to their work, but it was also interesting to see how excited they were to hear I was incorporating science in my works. My next album will be called Dark Matter, which is scheduled to be released in 2013. It will be a cosmic journey through the universe, galactic adventure, a personal look into the dark and distant past and the bright future, this cosmic web of galaxies, quasars, black holes, and all these other interesting things that's in that big clump of soup. <laughs> speaking about. You know, this is matter that influences the evolution of the universe gravitationally. My goal is to influence the evolution of hip hop and schooling gravitationally by pulling students in. Now, now that hip hop has become the single most dominant cultural touchstone in the lives of most youth, Chris Edmond, Rap Genius, and I have come together to sponsor Science Genius. We choose hip hop as an art form to educate the listeners about scientific topics. As I said before, I'm not a science teacher. I go into classrooms as an artist and provide a model for students to communicate the information learned from their science teachers. My role in the process is to encourage students to compose creative writing, not just through rhyme, but through a metaphoric narrative approach to animate science concepts so that the material can be digested by the students in an interdisciplinary way. The rhymes are a starting point to introduce this technique of seeing science in a new way, a new context. I challenge students to not be too literal and write compelling stories. Make it half short, twice strong. Light as an atom or hydrogen, so it's not too heavy and doesn't trouble the souls of the listener. But heavy as a neutron star to where it's mind boggling. One thing I try to impart in the classroom that the rhyme must be clear, eloquent, witty, and clever. I challenge students to make sense of complex information while maintaining high standards of serious lyricism. I believe that science is important because it helps you gain a deeper understanding of yourself and your surroundings. Knowledge of one's environment, specifically through science, can increase self-awareness, confidence, and critical thinking skills that can translate outside the classroom. I just heard a commercial on today that said, children need to learn science in order to succeed in this global society. I believe that to be true. Hip hop is important because using a vehicle the students are already familiar with decreases their resistance to the technical jargon in science, giving them more control over their communication while incorporating science concepts into their everyday vocabularies. Thank you for coming to show your support. I'm actually from Rockland County, New York, and our school oh, district okay. is East Trimacal Central School District. And one of the questions I would have is, why is it limited to only New York City? And have you considered, um, with our district in particular being primarily made up of children of color, um, reaching outside of the arena? For us, it's a disadvantage because we're only 30 minutes from New York City. And every initiative and every great thing that's happening when it comes to innovative things for young people are only happening in the city. So has anybody ever considered, I just actually text Dr. Gordon, Edmund Gordon, and I said, you know, is there any way we can figure out how we can bring this 30 minutes up the street, which is Rockland County? I mean, I'll take that question. What we want to do with this project is we want to make sure we get it right. Um, and we, like I said, we had such an overwhelming response of schools who were interested. It's mind boggling, just in New York City alone. And we had to limit to these 10. That's why the 10 schools, like, you guys better rep hard. But we limited to these 10 schools because we want to ensure that we got this completely correctly, that we have the matrices in place to ensure that we can measure this accurately. Because there's nothing that's more horrific than having a, an amazing idea that's not well planned, that's not well articulated, that, that, is, that is not sort of nuanced. But I assure you, just a, you want to tell them what you, what you said about the possibilities for the project? I'll do it. He says, I mean, he said, he was like, this, this could be, this would be like the, the science rap spelling bee one day. 
And we really envision it being that. Well, we're going to do that here first and do all the hard work. And I, I'm sure at some point we're going to hit Rockford. So this is a pilot program. It is. Thank you. You're welcome. Hi, my name is Anel. Um, not a question. Had I known there was a Q&A period, I would have probably prepared. But it's, this is more like a comment. I am a hip-hop enthusiast. I brought my daughters, Roxanne and Layla. I was invited by Jeremy, who I know is a good friend of yours. So excited to be here. So excited. And, so, and I just commend you, Jizza. Commend you for putting this together. Um, I think that hip-hop as ubiquitous as, as, as it is, and is, is, a, is a gateway, I think, to so many things. And, and I just love the fact that this is happening, especially in New York City, in an inner city. You know, I, I love it. So just that, just I commend you, Jizza. Commend you guys. Uh, thanks, everyone, here for hosting this great event tonight. Um, obviously, this could be a very powerful tool. Um, after a pilot program is successful, are there any plans on, you know, signing additional artists up to uh, get behind this initiative, expand to other genres? I mean, like you said before, this doesn't need to stop in uh, New York City, obviously. Um, so definitely, I mean, Rock Genius is a tool in education. Already we have, from just collaborating with Jizza, we've been rappers that all of us know are writing to us and saying that they want to get involved. School districts all over the country are wanting to get involved. And so before, you know, Chris and, and hopefully more people to help him can expand this to other districts, Rap Genius just as a tool in the classroom is absolutely accessible to everyone. And, you know, we're welcome to show you how you can use it in the meantime as a way to do close reading and go from just comprehending a text to really synthesizing all of the, the, the concepts therein. So we have Lupe Fiasco who wants to do things and many more are, uh, artists who see how music and hip hop can be the vehicle to like a more acute understanding of education, ed educational topics. Um, good night. Um, I actually came here by accident. Um, actually, uh, you know, somebody sent me a text. Um, so somebody actually knows a uh, 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 professor's uh, wife and, uh, you know, uh, told me to do research on him. So I'm really here for, you know, Professor uh, Edom, but I'm glad I was here. I'm glad I was able to taking all the science. Um, my name is Malek, by the way. I go to John Jay College. I'm studying to be a lawyer. And um, my, 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 uh, my, my focus and my, my real question for you guys tonight is, um, I'm actually a hip hop artist as well. How, how important is it for today's youth and generation to understand the correlation? I was, I was watching a lot of, um, of videos that uh, the professor has on his website and how you know he makes these connections. But um, for you guys, you guys study different areas of science. How important is it for them to really understand that there's a real connection and not just rapping and rhyming lyrics and making things sound cool in a scientific manner? I think that would be a perfect question for any of the scientists to take. <laughs> well, I, I think the idea is to, to try to make sure that um, uh, national standards uh, for learning for particular classes are incorporated into and are, and are part of the judging and criteria uh, by which um, you weight a particular rap artist um, to, to win and move up the chain. So yes, yeah, so, so there should be um, some standards um, of knowledge that should be imparted and delivered. Thank you. So I just want to say one other thing to sort of wrap the hip hop side of things is like, you know, a true lyricist isn't someone who just says something dope, but actually says something. So it, it's it's a lot closer than people think because you can't just come with like some some good punchline. You have to really be saying something underneath that punchline to have the kind of credibility as a lyricism. So I think uh, Chris and Jizza and all of us have talked about how before it's about a good metaphor, it's also just about showing that you really understand the topic underneath that metaphor. Everybody on this side, so we're just going to go here and then back and forth. Roy Stone Martinez, I was in class in the final, so forgive me for coming late. Just a question, um, how do you entice students, particularly black males, to come to school to even begin engaging in this conversation when we know that they're the ones who, really, who are getting left behind following Latino males? Mm -hmm. I mean, that, that's what the initiative is all about. It's, it's knowing 
of having a really in-depth understanding about what it is that captures their interests. That's essentially it. We know that, I mean, I wouldn't want to go to a place that felt like a prison either. And so that's just why they're out. So, I mean, the way, the way to sort of change it and get them engaged is to restructure schools. This initiative is not just about this Science Genius Project. What I foresee it as is a first step towards restructuring schools so you'd see themselves as being able to be successful in those schools and then they're more apt to come. So it's really about changing the game, restructuring the, the entire thing in a way that meets the needs of a new generation. My name is Gwen, and um, I, I was um, three years in all county chorus. And um, like as you were saying about music and things, and I kind of like my school is losing all their music and arts and things. So I don't really like know what to do. And uh, like sometimes I make my own music, but I just don't really know like what to do since we're losing everything. And like what should I do? What should I? What should be the first step I take? <laughs> One thing I, I always tell my students is that you have to be able to advocate for yourself and that you have to be able to write about your complaints and have a voice. I mean, that's the, that's, the, that's the first immediate thing. So if you feel like you're being robbed of an opportunity to get an education, which is what you're saying, then you have to be able to write that down and send that to the folks in power to tell them how you feel about it. Another thing is always to gain allies. I couldn't do this project if I didn't have these brilliant scientists here and this, this amazing MC here and people in the audience. So, this is the perfect time. So before you leave here today, get my card, get some scientists, you know, and ask questions so that you can say this is what I'm concerned about and have people to advocate for you. Um, another thing also, and this is part of why this project is so important, is uh, with the elimination of music programs, well, hip hop music is music that does not necessarily require the monetary investment that traditional schools feel the music programs are like. It takes a mic, a Mac. <laughs> and a voice to so create beautiful music. And so part of what we're trying to do here is to show the schools that, okay, if you're losing the traditional music program, which is a travesty, we're giving you a new avenue through which you can sort of develop that musical intelligence and at the same time give the youth new opportunities. But thank you for your question, and, and make sure we talk before, before you get out of here. Thanks for holding this event. My name is Gerilyn. Um, and my question is, so after you prove that this pilot will work and that hip hop will engage students in science, what is the next step to make sure that like the DOE, that district leaders actually implement hip hop officially into the curriculum and teaching practices? And what can we do to help advocates, educators? Paul Forbes in the building, right? Paul Forbes in the DOE, you might raise your hand, sir. Yeah, right? So. Yeah. Um, Mr. Forbes. <laughs> yeah, we are all wondering what you're going to do with you said my No, you know, I, I, within any institution, however bureaucratic, there are people in there that believe in the power and potential of what we're doing. And I think it's our responsibility, all of us, to be able to show how it works and show that it works. I've been invited by um, Paul Forbes to the ESI initiative and said, listen, this is what we need to do, and articulated a plan. And he has these 10 schools who said, you know what, we'll try it. And it's just a matter of continuing to push. And if we continue to push, we'll get somewhere. We have 10 schools now who will push and show that this works. We have research that we've done already that shows that this works. And so if they don't respond, then we can say we just don't care. And I know that's not what you want to say, right, Mr. Forbes? <laughs> right, so, so it's, just, it's just an issue of continuing to push. And what can you do is advocate for us. You know. Tweet that you were at this event and you know that it has immense potential. Same thing I said to the young man. Share with people that this is a new way of approaching things. And if enough of us sort of garner the attention about this, we can move somewhere. We can get somewhere. Good evening. Uh, my name is Angela Harris and I'm a teacher in the Harlem community and I teach the Boys Choir of Harlem. Right now, it's uh, on, almost on its way out because music is going out and people are not doing what they need to do to keep kids interested in drama, and music, and the arts. I think this is an exceptional program and I think that you're doing a great thing to bring music alive. And our students, we have a lot of high-risk students and they do rap and they do love music. 
And what I want to know is how do we get a school like that involved with this particular uh, venture? Getting a school involved is as easy as, for at least for right now, sending an email, expressing some interest. You're not, we're not gonna just pick up schools, because like I said, we wanna make sure we do this right the first time. But, but once that's done, our plan is to expand this initiative further. Um, and, and so if there's a, a, a list of folks who are interested, we'll, we'll communicate with you later on as we progress. All the schools that we've selected also, they, they, they just, they're the same demographics you're describing. So they are, they are in urban areas, they're socioeconomically disadvantaged. They have issues with reten retention. They have issues, like, so when you describe your school, like, my heart goes out. But unfortunately, particularly in New York City, and I'm, I'm assuming also in Rockland, that's the norm. That's what we have. And, and that's why we're doing this. Unfortunately, in the interest of time, I can only take three more questions. So I'm going to go here, here, and then here to close. Can I just say one thing? Sorry. Please. The, part of the reason. Uh, you know, it's, it's amazing as someone like just as like you can right now have your students um, involved in the program sort of just by following along or given the nature of Rapture is being crowdsourced, they should log on and until it's their rap featured on the website, they should just have, you know, they should be helping the, the rappers who created them break down those lyrics and understand the science concepts and teachers in your school should use these students raps as an example for, for their own curriculum. You know, you, you sign up for Rap Genius Account, anybody can post something on the website. It's completely crowdsourced education. That's what it is. So to the extent that you want to get involved by just sort of following along until it's your turn to be involved in the program, you absolutely can just by signing up. Thank you, Nicole. My question is, will the program be open to other schools? Like, is this going to just be those 10 schools that... <laughs> it will not just be the 10 schools. It's not going to be just the 10 schools. And, and we're going to keep getting bigger and bigger just because people like you want it. We're going to keep doing it. On, on the heels of the lady who came before me, Geraldine, I really just want to, um, number one, thank you. Thank you all. But I also envision something that needs to happen down the road in terms of the CCSS and the Common Core and how our children respond to nonfiction pieces. That I really hope that in the future, people who evaluate our tests can see that if a child writes lyrics and writes a rap, that that will also be accepted in terms of their going deeper into the core material and showing their understanding. Yeah. That is absolutely built into what we're, what we're doing already. So looking at the artifacts that kids create as nonfiction text, this new focus on reflection, this new focus on metacognition and the meta metacognitive skills that are developed through the creation and the review of raps, this issue of interdisciplinary units, so kids working across subject areas, the writing as well as with the science. So we are deeply, deeply, deeply enmeshed in the language of and the practice of the Common Core and the Next Generation Science Standards because we know in order for us to be able to validate what we do, we have to show that it not only meets those standards, but it surpasses them, which it does. And it just so happens that the Common Core is already uploaded onto Rap Genius. So they can write raps and annotate raps, but they can also annotate the core. And I think if you put the raps right next to this boring text, or not boring text, I'm sorry. <laughs> you know, there, there, there's already, like someone else, many people said tonight, you're, you're predisposed to not liking it. But if you're doing your homework, uh, reading the Common Core, and trying to understand it on a website where Nas and Jizza and 50 Cent are also breaking down things, which they break down their lyrics, but they also break down Bible Versus just as broken down, you know, supreme mathematics on the site. Like you, you are doing, you were reaching them by not turning them off right away. So, so you can slip in a rap sometimes, but you can also slip in just a, a science article or The Great Gatsby or Shakespeare or anything. Final question, and then Kai, you know, get ready. <laughs> um, so I just tweeted that this panel. Uh, proves what I've always known to be true, that all the cool kids are actually nerds. Um, like John, I studied economics, so I was a different type of nerd. But this question is for how the panel related to Jizza and kind of how Jizza related to the panel. I think a lot of times um, 
there's a disconnect between children engaging to adults. Like adults are up here and they're down here. So you have someone that works for NASA, iconic hip hop artist. Masters of your field, but completely on the surface seemingly unrelatable. So talk to us a little bit about what you guys did to kind of make that connection. Because that, I think that would be useful in engaging kids. It's just really understanding that everyone is relatable. You can learn something from everyone. I can, I can speak to that a little bit. We, I work at the Museum of Natural History, as I said, and we have a lot of outreach programs. So what I you know, try and do, and what has been really a learning experience for me, is get involved with, with kids from disadvantaged schools. We bring them into the museum, we give them a research project where we mentor. And a lot of these kids just blossom. I mean, they really, um, by the end of the project, you know, they're co-authoring scientific papers with us. So it's just a great, you know, they, they get a real good feeling out of it. They, they build their confidence. And then you know, a lot of them go on to scientific careers, going to medicine, science. So I think, like I said, when I was talking, it's just it, having exposure to it and seeing that you know they can do it. it it's it's achievable. I think that's a huge, huge thing. Oh, we gotta we gotta take uh, one final question over there. Just walk right in. Is that Mario? Yeah. Wow. Um, I taught Mario in the seventh grade. How many years ago? Huh? Se longer than that. Wow. All right. Okay. So the young lady, your question, please, because you're the final question. My question is, do fly flies hibernate? <laughs> <laughs> that goes to the bioluminescence expert. That's a very good question. Actually, yes, they, they do. So in the winter, they they be under the bark of trees, or they can be buried in the ground. So, so over the winter, they don't die. They come out the the, the next summer. That you have more fireflies. So yes, in, in essence, they, they kind of go dormant for the winter. Very good question. <laughs> that that is a perfect. So now, just because I I, I'm, I I am a man of my word. And I promised Kai that I'll give him a chance to rap in front of just, I, I just hope. Um, um, I'm going to give Kai an opportunity to rap. So could you guys cue that instrumental for Kai? My name is Kai, nice guy, I'm fly, used to watch, Bill Nye, the science guy, uh. <laughs> my name is Kai, I'm fly, uh, my name is Kai, I'm fly. Hold up, I'm nervous. Just check it, I'm a physicist, lyricist, in this ridiculousness, so witness the ignorance I dismiss. Newton's laws of motion is the topic of the course because things of motion staying in motion unless they hit on a balanced course. Well, next up's the second law of situation. In summation, force equals mass times acceleration. And that's the second law Newton foresaw. Y'all want more than the third law's in store. Uh, every force has an opposite force and every action has an equal plus opposite reaction. The sum of all objects at rest equals zero. That's the object is no longer relaxing. I mean in motion, that's changing location till it hits traction, the coefficient of friction. And then it all comes to a full stop. There goes the on laws over here, pop. I'm about to spit the 16 DNA. I'm about to spit the 16 DNA. Said I'm about to spit the 16 DNA. Life is just a twist of ladder, climbing up the molecules, traveling up the double helix, man. I'm just making moves. Adenine and guanine, base pair tools. Diamine and cytosine go together too. Building blocks of life, yeah, that's what they call it. Needed in my living like the money in my wallet. My name's Kai, flight guy. I'm fly, used to watch. Bill Nye, the science guy, now I'm the science guy of today. 
last words to, to everyone and I'd like to thank you personally for being here. Thank all the scientists for being here. Um, it's okay to give shout out. My boy Kay came from my high school and I saw a student that I taught in the seventh grade and Martha Diaz is here from the Hip Hop Education Center and Spacecraft who are actually going to be working with us in the schools to get this work out. So just thank you for being here. I just want to thank everyone for coming down and showing your support. I think this is a great thing we got going on, and um, more schools will be involved. Thank you.